uh, I'll start off by saying hello to everybody and thank you so much for uh, taking time out of your busy schedule to, to join us. And it's always nice when we can be here with a, uh, a, a great group of fellow lake lovers. So I know that Tamara and myself are big lake fans and I see some other people on here who I know are big lake fans. So I really appreciate you coming and joining us because um, we are in Invasive Species Awareness Week for New York. And um, we are part of this larger event that is the ninth annual Invasive Species Awareness Week, um, June 12th, June 6th through 12th, and events are being held across the state to raise awareness about invasive species. Um, so we invite you to stay active on invasive species issues by getting involved with your local Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management, which is a coordinated group of organizations and citizens working together to prevent the spread of and manage invasive species. So following this event, you can take a moment to complete the uh, online feedback survey, if we will have that. And then um, you can learn more about New York Invasive Species Awareness Week and to see a list of all the events like our fun family-friendly boat launch thing that's happening, right? A uh, boat launch at Lake Flower that's happening right after this from two to five today in Saranac Lake. And then I think at 6.30 tonight, along with AWI, we are presenting um, the documentary Uninvited. So if you're in the area, please come out and join us or you can look for a different event near you. And I think Tamara can probably put in the uh, a link in the chat to, to that. Will do, Brian, I'm adding the link to the chat now. So, um, I work for the Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program. We are one of the eight New York prisms. And so here's a map showing the different regions. So wherever you are in New York, you're part of a prism. Um, I represent, I'm the Aquatic Invasive Species Coordinator for the APIP prism. And that's the Adirondacks going north to the border with Canada. So I'll talk about a lot of um, Adirondack examples in here, but I'll use some other statewide examples too. And uh, I'm housed by the Nature Conservancy. Um, our office is in Keene Valley. And uh, funding for the for our program comes from the New York DEC Environmental Protection Fund. So we're thankful for DEC and all the great support that they do for invasive species programs across the state. So um, when I start, like to start off my talks, I generally like to uh, start off with the, the big picture. And you, you really can't get much more of a big picture than, than this. And this is um, a, a famous photograph that's called Earthrise. It was taken by astronaut William Anders on Christmas Eve in 1968 during the Apollo 8 mission. And that was the first human mission to orbit the moon. And as they were orbiting around the moon, the Earth did an Earth rise, so kind of like a sunrise, but with the Earth coming up over the lunar landscape. And you can hear them on video uh, talking about what an amazing sight this was. And they said, oh, we got to get a photograph of it. And they took this photograph, and it's been called the most influential environmental photograph ever taken. And I've been recently listening and reading to a lot of things by astronauts. And the one common thing that they all say when they come back from outer space is that they feel a, a much greater appreciation and connection to the environment. And they, they generally say that's because when you're in outer space and you look out and you see this black vast expanse, and then you see the, you know, the rocky barren moon surface, and then you see this bright blue marble that we live on that's filled with water and plants and people and everything that you've ever loved and all your favorite foods. And, and we're all right here that it, it, it really brings home what a special place we have and how important it is to preserve it. And it kind of, this photo kind of got me thinking about another comment that they, a lot of people make is that, well, maybe our planet has been misnamed. It's, we call it earth, but maybe the planet should be called water. Because when you look at it from this far out, you see those big blue expanse. And everybody knows that the vast majority of our, our planet is actually um, taken up by water. And so uh, this is a bar chart that is showing you a series of of where the water is. So the vast majority of our water is in the oceans and only 2.5% of it is fresh water. Well, out of that 2.5% that is fresh water, uh, the vast majority of that is in the glaciers and ice caps. That's why we're so concerned about climate change that when those melt, that's gonna 
drastically change our sea levels and water levels. Um, only of that fresh water, only 1.2% of it is surface water that's easily accessible for human needs. And out of that 1.2%, um, it's almost 21% of it that's in lakes. And so lakes are really one of our most easily accessible and usable forms of water. But when you when you do this math all the way out, if you take this percentage of percentage of a percent, that means that lakes are 0.00627% of our polar Earth's water. So um, in the big picture, it's kind of a, a small uh, amount, but um, I like, as I like to tell anybody, um, a small percent of a really large number is still really large to us. And when you zoom in even closer, you can see that we, we do have these, a lot of lakes and we have a massive amount um, uh, of area that you can see. Here's a picture of North America and you can see the Great Lakes and there are two Great Lakes in New York, Lake Ontario and Lake Erie. And you can also in this picture, see some of right by the clouds, you can see some of the Finger Lakes. Um, there's been some estimates that globally, worldwide, does anyone uh, want to take a guess of how many lakes they think there are on, on, the, on the planet? You can type it in the chat or you can, uh, you can, you can shout it out. 550. There's more than 550 lakes in probably Franklin County where I, I'm, I'm in, but so we'll keep going higher. I saw one number. Yeah, 5,000 would be a little bit closer. But this is worldwide. So this is all across the world. Two million. Okay, we're getting close. A billion. So we're a little bit between two million and a billion. Uh, they estimate that there's 117 million lakes and that those lakes cover about 3.7% of our inhabited continental landmass. Um, about 90 million of those lakes are less than two football fields in size. So uh, most of these lakes aren't these great lakes, they're actually a little bit smaller. And uh, if you added up the shoreline of all those lakes, it would be almost 2 million miles. So that's the equivalent of going around the Earth's equator 250 times. Um, yeah, I think those numbers do count reservoirs. That's like I said, that comment in there, Julia. Um, and so now we're even gonna zoom in a little bit further. This is Otsego County. Um, and so when you, this is kind of how we approach the landscape and you can see that, um, you know, these water bodies that we have on there, you can see some big ones and that's this big one on here. It's actually at Sego Lake. It's 4,000 acres and 7.8 miles long at, right at the, uh, right outside of Cooperstown, New York this is where the Susquehanna River starts for the, uh, the Chesapeake Bay watershed goes all the way down the Chesapeake Bay, but you can see these little dots all around there in these different areas. And um, and actually, this one right down here in the corner, this is one of my family's favorite lakes. Uh, this is Gilbert Lake, a 41-acre lake. Uh, it's actually in a state park, great for camping, great for, uh, great for fishing and, and going around. And so in New York, we have uh, over 7,800 lakes. And each one of those lakes is a special place to somebody. Uh, it's somebody's favorite swimming hole. It's somebody's favorite fishing spot. It's somebody's home or community is right there. So even though they might look really small on the landscape, they have a high importance. And um, out of those lakes in New York, um, 70, there's over 790,000 plus surface acres. And that's just the, the lakes with inside there. You know, we have these actually massive lakes on our border. So um, Lake Ontario is... Lake Ontario is actually the smallest Great Lake, but it's 4.7 million acres in size. Um, Lake Erie is 6.3 million in size. And I see Betsy made a comment of saying about like, is this lake versus ponds? Um, scientists just use the term, we just use the term lake, uh, you know, ponds, bays, sloughs. There's a lot of different common terms that people will use. So when I say lake, I'm really referring to any open bodied uh, water body. 7,800 of them. So, um, so why, why do we love lakes? So when scientists talk about loving lakes, we, we look at oh, a, a term that we call uh, ecosystem services. And we can get really nerdy about it and we can break it down in kind of like these charts of saying like, well, there's extractive lake uses like 
drinking water and agriculture water and we can make hydropower and there's food and chemicals that we get from it. And there's also these non-extractive things like recreation. So like boating, fishing or nature viewing. Um, there's things like aesthetics and awe and art and um, a spiritual value that comes from these places. We can use lakes for navigation and transportation. And they have all sorts of these great um, supporting and regulatory surface like nutrient cycling, carbon sequestration, flood protection, biodiversity. But really this is kind of like a very academic way of looking at it. When, when we really normally think about our, our water bodies, we think of it more like this. We think of the the, the fun times we had fishing with our family. We think about the fun boating or swimming, the great wildlife habitat that the lakes provide. They're just the sheer beauty of so many of the lakes in New York have. And uh, I really like enjoying looking at some, um, some of the, let's go back and looking at like historical photos. And you can see that this is not a new trend that we have been enjoying and recreating with our lakes in New York for hundreds of years. And so these are really uh, in incredible places that, you know, we, we care about for, for thousands of years, you know, really long time. Um, unfortunately, our, our lakes in New York, are there are some large scale threats to them. And so uh, climate change, non-point source runoff and aquatic invasive species are the three greatest threats to our New York lake ecosystems. Um, this little diagram on the right is from Lake Champlain and showing the Lake Champlain watershed. And what this is showing is um, the equivalency of where the, with climate change, that the, the water and the watershed is heating up. And so what the temperature was like in the 1960s and 1990s, uh, eventually by the you know, 2040 to 2050 will be like the climate of, of Virginia if our current um, emission scenarios continue. Um, and then the bottom, you can see that blue and red bar on there. Um, the blue is when the lake froze over completely. Lake Champlain would freeze over completely. And then the red were years that it didn't freeze over completely. So you can see as we've gotten more recently, it's a much more higher frequency in the lake not freezing. So this is gonna be a huge change to our ecosystems here with, with climate change. And it's really the greatest factor that we're facing. Uh, Non-point source runoff is the fancy technical way of saying that the, all the land area that drains to a watershed can influence it. So our homes, our businesses, our roads, um, our farms, all of that can have impacts when it rains and that water runs across the land and eventually ends up in a stream or in a river. And then we have aquatic invasive species, which is going to be the focus of our talk today. Uh, aquatic invasive species are a a uncontrolled experiment where we are moving plants and animals, humans are moving them from place to place, and we can have sometimes unforeseen and strong impacts on our, on our lakes. And so um, we're going to talk a little bit more about them, but in, in general, I want to tell you why APIP and you probably care about aquatic invasive species or abbreviated AIS. First is the economic impacts in New York. Uh, in New York, we have a large outdoor recreation and tourism economy, and a lot of that is centered on, on our lakes. This is a picture of Lake George, and with all the people coming to, to boat and stay in hotels and, and restaurants, um, you can really see from this photo, like this quickly adds up to being a, a fair amount of money. Um, and invasive species can unfortunately negatively impact uh, our, our economies in many different ways. And we'll talk about some of those further on in there. Invasive species also have ecological impacts. Um, and these can vary from loss of biodiversity, where invasive species can outcompete and push away our native species. They can change and disrupt food webs so that the abundance or the presence of other native species is um, changed. Uh, they can also affect water quality. They can lead to having warmer temperature. They can lead to eutrophication, um, increase or spreads of nutrients in there. And also pathogens. Sometimes when the invasive species come in, they can either promote or carry with them uh, pathogens that can kill other plants and organisms, and sometimes even affect human, human health.
And last but definitely not least is stewardship. Uh, we are the lucky people that have inherited this beautiful landscape filled with lakes and that, you know, since the, the Native Americans have been here, have been taking care of and, and using them. Um, and those are, it's really important for us to kind of pay that back forward, um, you know, both to our future selves and to future generations. Uh, I see a question in there I, in the last slide. Uh, we mentioned eutrophication. Eutrophication is a very fancy way of saying increased nutrients. So as we get increased nutrients in our watersheds and water bodies that can lead to negative impacts like increased plant growth or uh, algal blooms or even harmful algal blooms. Okay, so now I'm gonna highlight some species and some of their impacts on lakes that you um, may already know about and maybe talk about some indirect impacts that you, you might not know about. Because like I said, when we move these species, it's really like this unchecked, unplanned experiment. But first, first, it is important to recognize the pathways of spread. So for aquatic invasive species, we are the problem. It is humans that are intentionally or unintentionally moving these organisms around. Um, and these are the three most common ways. So through boats, so sometimes it's big boats like cargo ships, or are just our recreation or canoes, kayaks, motorboats on trailers, that when we move from water body to water body, we can be unintentionally moving um, some species. Uh, another pathway is through bait buckets. So anglers will be out fishing. They might collect some, some bait in one lake, go to another lake to go fishing. And when uh, they're done at the end of the day, say, well, I don't need any more of this bait and then just dump it into the lake. And so that can spread invasive species. And then um, aquarium release. Uh, you can buy plants and animals from uh, aquarium stores and people will have them in their home and they'll raise them. And then for whatever reason, they, they outgrow them or they, they wanna get rid of them and they don't want to do that in a proper way, in a humane way. They just take the aquarium and they dump it in a local water body. And so those organisms can escape. So one of our poster childs for invasive species is uh, the zebra mussel. And the zebra mussel is a small, about one inch size mussel that came over from uh, Eurasia uh, on, on cargo ships in the ballast water of them. And when it got to the Great Lakes, they would they discharge this ballast water that had um, some villagers some, and some maybe even adult zebra mussels in it and they spread rapidly. And you can see this picture of a shopping cart to where they can just grow over just about anything uh, in the water. And so they become very dominant in, in some of our waterways. And they're spread all across um, New York and, and much of the Eastern um, United States. Uh, well, these mussels are filter feeders. So they are filtering out uh, zooplankton and algae and things from the, the water column. They're changing the food webs and they're really changing the water clarity. The water clarity in Otsego Lake has increased by almost 20 feet in some areas because of uh, zebra mussels. And so that changes how deep that sunlight can penetrate. It, ch it changed where the, the thermocline, the, the, the heated water is, um, and can affect where aquatic plants can grow. And then you can see these pictures of like this pipe here where they can get on things, boats, docks, so thick that we have to pay all this money to um, you know, manually re remove them. So the zebra mussels can have um, large, large impacts and large uh, effects on our lake ecosystems. Another one is a uh, round goby. This one also came over through ballast water to the Great Lakes by cargo containers. Um, this is a small bottom fish, generally five, four to 10 inches in size. Um, there are some native fish that look kind of similar like a sculpin or a darters. Um, but this one has a fused pelvic fin and this dark spot right up on it. Um, because one of the things like the gobies came over from Eurasia where there were uh, zebra mussels. Well, they actually eat mussels. They're one of the few things that can eat zebra mussels. So you might think, oh, hey, this is great. We got one invasive species eating another invasive species. Well, unfortunately, um, they, they don't eat it enough where they can contain it. but um, it presents some other problems. So this is a, a photo, 
an illustration from this food pathway where zebra mussels and quagga mussels are filtering things out from the lake. Sometimes that's bad stuff that we don't like, like heavy metals or um, botulism. The goby will then eat those mussels and upcycle those materials. And so they can get sick from botulism and then um, get weakened or die themselves. But then there are birds that will eat them like mergansers or loons. And so since 1999, over 80,000 birds have died on the Great Lakes um, due to uh, avian botulism. And one of the leading theories is that it's from this invasive species cascade of where zebra mussels, gobies, and then up to um, fish. So this is why the goby is moving through uh, New York right now. It's moving through um, our canal. So it's moved through uh, the Erie Canal from uh, Lake Ontario into the Mohawk River and now into the Hudson River. And so we really want to make sure that we can try to contain it because we don't want it to spread to other areas where it can cause uh, more birds to die. Um, one of our most common plants is invasive plants is Eurasian water milfoil. This is a plant that is a submerged rooted plant that can grow up to 18 feet deep and um, grow in really dense beds uh, that can really impact, you know, recreation, swimming, um, people being able to boat. And here's a picture of um, an APIP staff member pulling it up. And you can see just like in just incredibly, incredibly thick on there. Well, unfortunately, um, this Eurasian water milfoil can have uh, lots of costs associated with it. So there are management costs with trying to remove it. It can cost anywhere from, you know, seven to $10,000 a week to hire a dive crew to go and help hand harvest it. Um, we have lake associations and communities that are spending, you know, 20 to over a hundred thousand a year on, on removal. Some of our larger communities and lake associations like the Upper Saranac Foundation or the Lake George Park Commission, they've spent millions of dollars in the past decade trying to uh, control um, Eurasian water milfoil. Uh, there's also a, an associated loss of tourism and, and fishing. So as it grows in very dense in areas, it can impact boating and, and, and fishing. And so that can also impact our economies. And there has also been um, decreased property values associated with lakes once they've been are invaded by Eurasian water milfoil. So studies from Vermont and Wisconsin have demonstrated that uh, lakes that have Eurasian water milfoil compared to lakes that don't can see anywhere from a one to 16% decrease in their property values. And this can, this can uh, you know, impact obviously the, the local landowners, but also the local communities as their tax base decreases. So these are just some examples of how, you know, the an invasive species can impact our, our, our economics also. Um, the next one I'm going to talk about is actually a forest pest. It's uh, called hemlock woolly adelgid. This is a little, it's a super tiny um, insect. This is like a, a, an electronic micrograph picture of it. Um, and you commonly see it on the, the basis of these hemlocks, right where the leaves uh, meet the stem. And the, it makes this woolly kind of sack to protect us. And that's where it gets the, the woolly part of its name. Um, and this is a, a species that is uh, expanding in New York. It started to move into the Adirondacks. And this is one of these examples where as our climate warms, um, the really cold temperatures kill hemlock woolly adelgid, but as we don't get as many cold, cold nights, um, it can, it's starting to move further north. And you might be saying like, okay, why are we talking about a forest pest that affects a tree in a, in a lake talk? Well, it's actually our watersheds are, are connected. And so I'm gonna kind of walk you through 
this ecological and economic ripple effect about how our forests can actually impact our, our lakes. So hemlocks are a very common species in New York and very super common in the Adirondacks. Um, and one of the great things about them is they've become these very large mature canopies that uh, shade our streams and our lakes and they hold in the soil and the nutrients and prevent erosion. And so uh, by doing that, they help reduce the, uh, the water temperature in there. And as the streams and lakes are cooler, that means that they can hold more dissolved oxygen and they are clean, clear, cold water fisheries that lake trout like. So in lakes that are cold and clear and deep, um, we'll have more lake trout. And on lakes that have more, more, lake, more trout on them, they're probably gonna have more, more people fishing, more anglers. Um, in New York, that's big money. Uh, in New York, $1.1 billion a year is spent on fishing and boating. That's the fourth highest in the country. That's billion with a B. So these trees in our watershed are going through this economic and ecological ripple effect that's benefiting both the fish and our communities. So now we take our forest and say they get invaded by hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, forests that are invaded can go from four to 20 years. You can see large die-offs of hemlock trees if not properly treated and managed. So if the trees die, then the water temperature is going to go up. There's likely to be more erosion and nutrients leaching into our stream. That means the amount of dissolved oxygen is going to go down in our lakes. And if the amount of dissolved oxygen goes down, we're gonna change these from these cold, clear water fisheries to, to being not as good habitat for the, for the lake trout. So there could become less lake trout. And now if there's less trout in our streams, maybe there's gonna be less people, less anglers out there fishing and less money for our communities. So this is just kind of an example of how our trees are tied to our lakes and they're even tied to our, uh, our economics in, in New York. And um, I think the last species I am going to highlight is hydrilla. Um, this is, uh, some people kind of call this the, the Godzilla plant. It can grow uh, incredibly uh, thick um, and that, you know, does all the, the traditional things that we are impeded by, like recreation, boating, swimming, fishing. Um, it, has generally leaves of whorls of, of four to six, and it has little serrations on it. There's a native plant that's called um, L common waterweed or Elodea canadense. It usually has leaves and whorls of three and has a smooth margin. Um, but hydrilla is one that is starting to appear in, in New York. Um, it is one that we believe was, was originally introduced as an aquarium dumped species. Um, and now it's getting moved around with, by people on boats. Um, it's in the, some, part, some of the Finger Lakes. It's in um, the Buffalo region, Lower Hudson, Long Island. But the majority of the state doesn't have it. And we really want to keep it out. Um, and this, this next story is a story that I, I've heard this past year. And it's a really interesting one to talk about these kind of unintended consequences and the, the vast impacts that um, invasive species can have and sometimes how unpredictable they are. Um, back in the 90s, um, we started to see large eagle die-offs in the southern part of the United States. And so this really kicked off a, a 20 plus year research pathway that was led by um, Dr. Susan Wilde from the University of Georgia and Dr. Timo Niedermeyer from um, Martin Luther University in Germany. And they were able to work on this and find this uh, incredible deadly cascade that involved um, hydrilla plants. And it's, an, it's amazing for both the scientific um, rigor and understanding they put into it, but then also just the, these impacts that invasive species can have. So we'll kind of walk um, you through this. So um, reservoirs and lakes in the south were getting invaded with uh, invasive hydrilla. And uh, in these, some of these areas, they observed that there was large eagle die-offs. When they looked at the hydrilla, they noticed that there was a cyanobacteria, what they mostly believe is a native cyanobacteria that was growing 
uh, very dense along the surface of the leaves. So the, the plant provided the substrate, the habitat for this cyanobacterium. Well, in the presence of uh, chemical bromide, they found that that cyanobacteria could produce a neurotoxin. And that neurotoxin um, caused what they call uh, VM or vacular melanopathy, which affects reptiles and fish and amphibians, but also the birds. And so uh, native birds like coots and ducks were eating the aquatic vegetation as a byproduct, were eating this um, cyanobacteria that had a neurotoxin and it would make these birds sick and that they would die themselves. Um, and then eagles and other birds of prey like vultures and great horned owls were eating those sick and dying um, waterfowl and they themselves were developing this, uh, this, this brain disease and dying themselves. And so, um, you know, who would have thought that the connection from what was killing uh, these eagles goes all the way back to an invasive plant, but there's a pretty strong link to this. Um, this research was published in Science in 2021, and it was actually just awarded um, one of the highest prizes given for the having uh, research that uh, clearly it was innovative, showed scholarship, and um, had wider interdisciplinary significance. And so Tamara just put in this great YouTube video. Um, it's a five-minute video that you can uh, watch later on talking about the researchers and how they went through this process. So incredibly fascinating. So um, what can we do? We just said all these examples about how invasive species can impact our economics and hurt our native wildlife. Um, and, you know, we, we love our lakes. And so we want to do the things to help protect them. And uh, the good news is, is that there are easy steps that all residents, visitors, and communities can do to, to help protect our lakes that we love. And so we kind of break this down into three categories, prevent, monitor, and manage. And if we do these three steps, then we'll have healthy lakes in our communities. Um, and in the Adirondacks, the Adirondack Watershed Institute is the organization that is in charge of the boat stewards. And besides just being out there uh, checking your boats for invasive species before they, you put in or take out of the water body, they're actually collecting data. And this data is really powerful for us. Remember, we said that the greatest threat is when we are moving from water body to water body. So when you look at these pie charts, you can see that um, the blue areas are boats that are just going to the same water body. The orange areas are ones that are, haven't been in the water um, that season or haven't been in the water in the past two weeks. So really it's only the, this, this gray section, which is about a third of boats um, that we're worried about. It's boats that are moving from lake to lake. And their data shows that about 3% of the motor boats and about 0.2% of the non-motorized boats have aquatic invasive species on them. So it's a small percentage of the boats that are our highest risk. But in the Adirondacks and across New York, we have people coming from all over. Uh, in the Adirondacks, we have boats that are coming from 40 different states, six different Canadian provinces. And here's um, a list of some of these areas that are, that, are, that are invaded. So you can see they're coming from Lake Ontario. They're coming from um, Lake Champlain, the Hudson River, Saratoga Lake, other areas that we know have um, invasive species present. And so when they're coming to us, they could potentially uh, transport them. And so this pathway is mainly through what we call recreational boats. Um, uh, we also, through like the Great Lakes and the seaways, have uh, the cargo um, boats, which have ballast water, but that has been greatly reduced as a pathway because we've implemented um, measures where now we, when they take ballast water on, they flush that ballast water in the open ocean, which has greatly reduced the um, amount of invasive species arriving. So um, what can steps can we take 
to, to prevent invasive species when we're going from water body to water body? Well, that's what we call prevention. And this is the most important step. And this is our old adage of an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Um, it is the most cost effective thing we can do. Once these invasive species get into our lakes, they can be very difficult, if not almost impossible to manage. So preventing them is the key. And to do that, you just have to remember three words, clean, drain, dry. And hopefully everybody knows this. Um, we're talking about cleaning anything that touches the water, the, the trailer, the boat, your fishing equipment, your, your water skis, um, you know, all of these different uh, types of um, materials that we're using on the water body. And really, um, you know, you wanna go through, uh, you know, remove any plant material, any mud, anything that you visibly see. But there's also things that you can't see, like um, spiny water flea or fishhook water flea or some of like the, the villagers, the, the, the larval stages of Asian clam or quagga mussels or zebra mussels. And that's why the, the best way to clean, drain, dry is to decontaminate. So we have free boat wash stations all across New York where they will use 140 degree hot water to spray down your equipment, put it through your live wells and your, your engine outtake and intakes of water, and um, we'll, we'll flush it all out and make sure that you're not moving. So that greatly reduces any risk of transporting stuff from, from lake to lake. Um, I'm seeing some question here um, on, can invasive species hitch a ride on a paddleboard? Um, yes, they could on a paddleboard or a canoe or a kayak. Um, it's less likely than a motorboat because motorboats usually have like intakes where they take in water or live wells or bait um, storage areas. Um, but if they're anywhere that, you know, you can catch something, they, they will have, um, they, can, they can have that. So anything can, can transport um, invasive species. And remember, this is not just the right thing to do because we care about the lakes, it's also the law. So across New York, everyone needs to follow clean drain drive for all boats and all equipment. Um, in the Adirondacks, starting today, um, there is a new uh, part of the law that requires all motorized boats must have a certificate certifying that they are following clean drain drive. The best way to get this certificate is to go to a decontamination station and they will do that hot water wash and they will give you a certificate that you can carry on you on your boat that um, certifies that your boat has been clean, drain, dried. You can also do a self-certificate, but really um, the best and one of the easiest ways is just visiting these sites. And if you look in the, um, the chat box, um, you can see uh, a link to a map for New York State showing you where boat stewards are and also where decontamination stations are that you can get one of these free boat washes. Okay, so that is um, prevention. So now we're gonna talk about monitoring. Um, if something does get in, we really wanna detect it early. And so this is what we call early detection. Uh, you're really looking for that needle in the haystack because if we detect it early, we have a higher likelihood that we can properly manage it at a much more uh, effectively and at a lower cost. Um, volunteers are a great way to do this. We have so many people that are out on our boats, uh, on boats, out on the water bodies, out on, on lakes. And so um, I'll talk a little bit about our Adirondack program called Lake Protectors, but you can also participate uh, in any way through many prisms and you can even use the uh, IMAP invasive app to report anything that you see in New York. Um, and then um, there's also professional monitoring. So there's staff like the, the PRISMs or different DEC, different agencies or contractors that can go out and do professional monitoring um, of your, your lakes. Um, so let me check. I see a couple of messages in here. Um, will will slides continue to be available? So um, yeah, we'll post the slides and we'll post a recording of this, so you'll be able to see this thing. Um, and then I see Kathy has a question: like, is clean drain dry required for boats staying on the same water body? Um, 
Yes. You are required to do clean drain drive for all boats before you put it into a water body. Um, you do not have to get a, in the Adirondacks, you do not have to get a separate certificate if your lake is only, if your boat is only staying on that same water body. It's when you move to a different water body that you would need to get a new certificate. Um, Tamara will probably put in a link to the DEC FAQ about those new, uh, some of those new regulations. Okay, so um, APIP Lake Protectors, we've had a volunteer uh, community science program since 2002. Um, and this is where we train volunteers how to identify and report invasive species. And so they are our eyes and ears out on the water, water bodies. Um, we've had thousands of surveys and hundreds of participants over the years. And here's a chart showing you the number of lakes and the number of volunteers we've had. Um, uh, last year, we had 110 lakes monitored in the Adirondacks and 153 volunteers. And so in the 20 years, we've had 464 lakes that have been monitored. And over 75% of these lakes are uh, aquatic invasive species free for the 16 species that we track in the Adirondacks. And this is really due to the great stewardship of the local lake associations, AWI, all our boat stewards, and people who love lakes following clean drain dry, making sure we're not moving species around. And this is critical information for us, knowing um, about the regional distribution of aquatic invasive species and helps us determine things like, where do we put boat stewards? And where do we need decontamination stations? And you know, where do people need to, um, be careful because if the closer your lake is to an invaded lake, the more likely you are to be invaded. Frequently, a lot of the communities will ask me, Lake Association will ask me, like, what's your recommended monitoring timeline? So um, I recommend each year um, that Lake Association communities are doing the prevention monitoring, having boat stewards, either professional or volunteer getting the word out to your community members and association members about the importance of clean drain dry and the importance of watching out for invasive species. Um, you should do monitoring for aquatic invasive species each year. Um, so participate in lake protectors or one of the programs in your region, and then also monitor water quality. So something like the Adirondack Lake Assessment Program or the statewide sea slap program are great ways. So that gives you uh, important information about if invasive species are present and what also is the water quality in your lake. Um, every three to five years, I think it's a good idea to have a professional crew come out to monitor for AIS. Um, also to, um, you can also come out and do some surveys and mapping of the physical characteristics. So you get a good good map of your lake showing, you know, the hardness or the, the depth profile of the lake is useful information. And then every six to 10 years, it's good to do a professional fish survey and a full plant census of natives and invasive. So you really have that snapshot view of what, um, what is present in your lake and at what abundance. And that can be useful in the future because as our climate changes and as um, you know, some of the nutrient change that could impact what your fisheries are, what your native species are. So it's important to know what, to, you have to have a baseline first. Uh, so I see one of the people is asking a question right here about any resources to help treating invasive aquatic vegetation um, in our water bodies. So that's uh, what the next stage is, we call management. So we have to prevention and monitoring. Um, now we have man to manage or management. And the best way, like I said, is if we can do rapid response. So if you see something and you can take advantage of it when it's um, newly established and there's not too much of it, you have a higher likelihood of being able to, uh, to successfully remove it. And rapid, um, you know, we're not talking about like, most of the time it's not like days or hours. Um, it's, it's about the extent of the invasion. It's more about the size of it. So I'm gonna review some of um, the best management practices and then talk about a program that APIP runs called Lake Management Tracker. So um, uh, kind of a success story of this, this uh, monitoring and rapid response is, is Moody Pond. Moody Pond is a small pond in Saranac Lake. In 2018, a 
Eurasian water milfoil was discovered by a volunteer, a lake protector. In 2019, it was confirmed and mapped by APIP so that the community knew where it was and what they were dealing with. And that really spurred the local community to action. They formed a friends group, a nonprofit called Friends of Moody Pond, and they were able to, to raise money through donations and, and events. Here's a photo of them at one of their challenges, raising money to, to hire a harvest team to go out and do um, the management to remove it. And, and they also participated in our lake management tracker. So this is kind of like a success story of where a volunteer saw it early, we confirmed it and now the local community is working on managing it and we we're hopeful that because they found it and started working quickly on it that um <coughs> they're most likely to be successful and they're going to harvest again this summer and we're hoping for really good results so um one class of best management practice are mechanical. This is when you are trying to remove the plant. So an example can be like hand harvesting. So if it's something like water chestnut that floats on the surface, they're you know pulling off these uh, adult plants on the surface. If it's something like Eurasian water milfoil that's submerged, you have to have a diver um, go down and, and pull the plant out along with its roots. Um, another technique is called diver assisted suction harvesting, um, where they use a, they still pull the plant out with their hand, but then they use a, a suction uh, pump to put it into that pump and pump it up into the surface where they collect it. And then there's another uh, physical method called um, benthic mats, where you're putting down a barrier at the surface the the, the the lake bottom, and that prevents the invasive species to grow through it. Um, it also prevents all native species to go grow through it and kills everything underneath it. So, um, and that's a good reminder that with all of our techniques, there are pluses and minuses to each of them. And so uh, lake managers and communities are looking to choose the right tool for the right job. And sometimes that, that, what, that it can change based on the amount of resources you have, what the invasive species is, or um, you know what the the conditions currently are, or what your resources and funding levels are. So other types of BMPs are chemical. This is where you are putting something like an herbicide into the water. There are contact herbicides um, where they come in contact and they damage the plant and can kill it. And then there's also systemic herbicides where the plant absorbs it into them and then um, it can go, th it travels throughout the plant and it will kill it. There's also biological BMPs. Um, so where you're using a living organism that has been tested to be effective for it. Um, an example of one example, a couple of examples are like carp. So sometimes we put in, um, hybrid sterile carp in the lakes where they eat the plants. Once again, they are generally not selective. They'll eat all the plants. So, you know, there's some, there's the positives and negatives we talk about. Um, there's also some insect biocontrol. Here's a photo of, um, of some insects that are eating uh, uh, purple loosestrife, a common wetland plant that we have. Um, uh, so APIP runs a program called Lake Management Tracker. It's not just enough that you should be doing the management, but really we want to make sure that the management is effective and that you're reaching the goals that you set out with. And so this program helps communities assess their management success of invasive species. We've had nine lakes participate since 2018, and the majority of these lakes are managing Eurasian water milfoil. And so uh, APIP provides the technical training and uh, assistance and the local communities and lake association provide the volunteers to go out and to do the, to do the work. Um, uh, the data is all collected in the survey one, two, three app using a point intercept methodology. And since we've done this, we've had over 4,000 observations um, from, from across these lakes. Uh, here's an example from Upper Chattagay Lake. I think we have Bill and Kathy on. They're the people who collected this data. They do an incredible job. And so you can see here's the map of the locations. Um, as yellow means few Eurasian water milfoil, orange means trace of sparse, and red means dense. So it can show us where it is growing. And because they're going to the same place year after year, we can see that um, from 2019 to 2021, uh, Eurasian water milfoil has actually increased in its locations 
um, in this area, um, despite the management that happens there. Um, kind of give you like a little success story of this. We have Loon Lake. They've been participating since 2018. Uh, this chart over here shows that uh, from 2020 to 2021, they saw that 65% of the sites had no change, uh, approximately around 25% of the sites increased and around 8% uh, of the sites decreased. So they had a net increase of around 17%. So their data showed that despite their harvesting, there was more of invasive species, more Eurasian water milfoil in the lake. Their local funding source, their local municipality wanted to cut their budget that they were using to harvest. And the lake association was able to use this data to justify, hey, this is not the year to cut our budget when we're seeing an increase in the amount of invasive species. And so this is a really good example of what we call the adaptive management cycle. They're setting goals, they're planning, they're implementing that plan by harvesting, and then they're collecting data where they can evaluate and learn from it. So, um, you know, they've been able to take this data and turn it into useful information to help them better manage their lake. And, you know, that's really a great success story, even though the invasive species currently is not at the level that they want it to be. They're still using the proper tools and methods to helpfully set them up to get to where they want to be. So yes, BMP stands for uh, best, best management practice. And you know, these are just some examples and we can talk about more of these at the end with a question. So you know, really to, to wrap it up and to bring it full circle, um, we are so lucky that we have so many beautiful lakes all across New York throughout all seasons, uh, winter, spring, summer, and fall that uh, people can enjoy. They're the point of prides for many of our communities. So uh, these lakes and landscapes are critical to our health, to our economies, and to our ecosystems. But it, it's, it's not about the lakes. You know, really it's about the people. Because if we do not have people that care about our lakes, that love our lakes and wanna give back, then nothing else matters. So it's the boat stewards, it's the lake association members, it's the volunteers at the decontamination station, it's our volunteers who are going out and looking for aquatic invasive species. And really what we want to do is create a culture of all the people that love lakes to help give back to them and help protect them by doing these simple steps of clean, drain, and drying to prevent, monitoring, their, their lakes for invasive species. And then if they do have invasive species, trying to manage them. So um, with that, uh, we need you to join us. Um, we would love to have you participate if you're in the Adirondacks or anywhere across New York. Um, you can help us monitor and manage invasive species um, in, in lakes. And hopefully that everybody remembers prevention is the key and um, we'll do clean, drain, and dry. So uh, with that, I will we'll leave the last bit of time that we have here for, for questions and we can open it up. I have a question. Yes. Um, I'm from the town of Chatham and we have a small pond and I can, unfortunately I can't give you the acreage but it's pretty darn small um, in a park. And because of excessive rainfall last year, and how the water comes into the pond. We've had uh, like a huge amount of duckweed and water meal. And I think we also have a little bit of curly leaf. And now we, you know, like you talked about like identifying early, we didn't act early and we have a lot of this. And it's a pond where we do swimming lessons and we just did a comprehensive plan survey. And like the number one comment about our park was the water is horrible. So now that we're dealing with it, it looks like we need to possibly do an application of sonar um, and I was wondering, is there a resource for anyone, but in particular municipalities, to get these permits, or do we have to go through private vendors? Um, yeah, so there's a couple parts to that question. Um, yeah, so, you know, you're kind of talking about that whole example I talked about where, you know, something on the watershed changes, you know, runoff or nutrients can change, and then you're seeing a difference in plant growth. Uh, I would like to note that across New York, we are hearing from people that um, that lakes are plant growth is changing, 
And one of the, the major factors from that is the climate change and the nutrients. And that is both native plants and invasive plants. And so I tell people it's kind of like a garden. Think of your garden at home. If you uh, put more sunshine and more fertilizer in that garden, what do you think would happen to the plants? Well, the same thing is happening underwater to our lakes in many cases. Um, so um, yeah, I really encourage you to, to you know reach out to your local um, you know, your local prism or your, your local um, like soil and water conservation district and try to see like what what is the best option? What are your options? You know, because each lake, you know, doing either like the mechanical BMP, a chemical BMP or a biological one or some combination. Sometimes it's a combination of them. Um, you know, it, it really is kind of lake specific and you have to figure that out. So, you know, working with either um, some a local resource like one of your prism uh, prisms or like the the soil and water conservationists or you can there are um, private lake managers consultants that you can hire um, to do that you know if you are going to do just about any type of best management practice you're going to need a permit um, through either the DEC your local communities um, the APA uh, to to do that so. Um, yeah, I can't tell you exactly like, you know, I don't know enough of the specifics like to say yes, sonar is, you know, what you should do, but um, uh, you can follow up and, and get in contact with me or I can put you in the right contact with somebody who hopefully can help you. Okay, thank you. But the most important thing is that you're, you're, you're at the starting point. And so you're trying to, you know, do something. Yeah, we are. We're trying. We just, I just wish we started sooner, but it kind of snuck up on us. Yeah, it's one of, it is, and that's, that's where that early detection and the monitoring by having people kind of out there, you know, can really help. You know, the, the, the unfortunate reality with aquatic invasive species is that sometimes, you know, when they're in there, some of these species, there's very little we can do. Zebra mussel, spiny water flea, brown goby. Like once they get in, we, we don't really have any current technologies that can remove them. So that's why prevention really is the key. Um, and then even with some of the ones where we do have stuff like, you know, Eurasian water milfoil, um, you really got to be ahead of the growth, growth curve, you know, with like hand harvesting, you're essentially trying to pull it out faster than it can grow. Well, if it's the invasion has gone too far, it's very, very hard to do. It's going to take a massive amount of resources to do that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we can send out a link. Um, to where people can get in contact with your local prism, or if you just Google like New York prisms, it'll probably take you to the DEC page. Um, each one has their own website. Our website is 80kinvasives.com. But no matter where you live in New York, you have a prism. I would um, like that, yeah. Yeah, we can do that. Um, I also see that people talked about what's the name of the app. So um, I think maybe they're talking about the IMAP Invasives app. So that's a uh, mobile app where you can report you can take a photo and say, oh, I think I see hydrilla, or I think I see curly leaf pondweed. Take a photo, it asks you a couple quick questions, and then that gets submitted to the cloud, and it goes to a local expert who will then review it and confirm if it is that. So that's a great tool that um, everyone is using across the New York. You can also see where other people and professionals have mapped. So you can see what invasive species have already been identified on your lake or um, the lakes by you. Um, I see Tamara answering some of the questions about uh, clean, drain, dry. So yes, that does apply to canoes, kayaks, stand-up paddle boards, anything. Um, you know, you want to make sure you like canoes and kayaks, like you open up the cockpits, let everything drain off. You know, if you bring it to your home, you can give it a rinse down with the hose and then remove all the mud or plants or anything. And then, you know, in the summertime, dry means dry for seven days. So it's completely dried out before you move it. Or if you can't wait seven days to go to another water body, the best thing to do is to go to a decontamination station. And then the professional staff will spray it with that high powered 140 degree water and that will um, you know, kill everything uh, and remove it. Yeah, and they they they'll the the 
the boat sewers are great at decontaminating all your equipment. They'll decontaminate, you know, your fishing equipment, your, your water skis, uh, the tubes, you know, that people are pulling behind their boats. Anything that touches the water potentially could spread aquatic invasive species. Uh, Julia, I see you have a hand, hand raise. Yeah, um, thank you for a great presentation. I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about what changed um, in terms of either like legislation policy or like what was the behind like the ballast water that you mentioned was kind of less of an issue nowadays than it has been in the past. And I was just kind of wondering a little bit about the backstory of that. Yeah, um, so that's kind of a, uh, a positive and negative story. So, you know, the negative was it, it took a while for, because it was, you know, a complex international trading system. You know, boats were coming from all over the world through the St. Lawrence Seaway, um, you know, through the locks and dams, all through the Great Lakes. Um, and so um, these boats, you know, have to take on ballast water to stabilize themselves and then, then they would release it. So it, it unfortunately took a while um, to get international agreements for the shipping to have them change their practices. And so in the Great Lakes, we have over 180 different non-native invasive uh, plants and animal organisms. They are some of our most invaded um, areas uh, in New York. Um, and so the, the sad news is there are some things, the, the damage was already done for those 180 species that are in there. Um, the good news is that now, since they've implemented international regulations that basically require the boats, they at their home port, they fill up with water. When they're traveling across the ocean, they essentially dump the water out and then retake in the salt water. And so, um, you know, the fresh, usually the freshwater stuff gets flushed into there. Um, it kills them, comes in when then they, when they move into the, um, the area, they're then able to um, do that same thing again. So it helps the, prevent the things of moving. And since they've implemented that, we've seen a decrease in the rate of invasive species showing up through international cargo ships. Excellent, thank you. Yep, and I see somebody asked a question like, um, yep, you can go online and you can see maps of, um, of a decontamination sites in in the Adirondacks and across New York. So those are great to get to. And also if you're looking for a, a summer job, different things, I know that AWI and some of our local places are still hiring. It's a great way to, to get involved and, and uh, make some money doing that. Um, I did see there was a question, any update on the Priscilla Corps lawsuit at Lake George? So um, in the Adirondacks, we have um, we have different levels of approval that we have to get than in other states. And so um, there is a new herbicide that is a systemic herbicide called Priscilla Corps. It's only been used once uh, on Minerva Lake in 2020. It got approved by the APA and DEC to be used um, in Lake George to, for Eurasian water milfoil. Um, but um, there currently is a lawsuit um, from from uh, local agents, nonprofits that are trying to prevent that. So um, there has been no um, no movement or update on that yet. The lawsuit is still currently um, in process. Let's see. If there are... Awesome. Well, are there uh, any more? questions or comments? I actually have one more quick question, if that's okay. Of course. Um, I was just wondering if you know how the DEC plans to kind of communicate or implement the motorized boat certification that just went to effect. Um, just because I know the majority of people coming are, or not, maybe not the majority, but a lot of people coming are coming from different states and even different countries. So how do they plan on kind of disseminating that information to make sure everyone's on the same page about that? Yeah, it, it definitely is something that is um, a challenge. And I know that DEC is uh, doing their best to, to work on it. Um, 
you know, we are, they, they put out a press release on Monday. Um, they're doing some outreach with some other organizations and in the media with it. And hopefully, you know, throughout the summer, they're going to roll out some more materials and do some more um, public facing events so the word can get out. You know, the, 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 the great thing is, is that the vast majority of voters already are following these steps. And so it's really not anything new that they have to do. They're just going to get a piece of paper that said that they did it. And so that's why we're trying to tell everybody the, the, the best way to do that is just to visit a decontamination station. It's the best way to decontaminate your boat, get a free boat wash at the same time, and then they will give you that uh, certification. And so then you're, you're good to go. And that's just to be clear, that new part of the law that goes into effect today only is for the Adirondacks and water bodies within 10 miles of the Adirondacks. Within uh, the rest of New York State, you do not have to have a certification on you that shows that you did that. Um, you still have to clean, drain, dry. That is still the law anywhere in New York, but you just don't have to have a piece of paper certifying that you did. A great question. And maybe, I don't know if Tamara did already put it in here, but um, there is an FAQ uh, on, um, uh, the DEC website, a link to it. So we can send that out and we can um, also recirculate that with other, uh, when we send a follow-up, the follow-up email, we'll have some of these links and things in it. Yeah, the FAQ um, from the DEC website is posted um, there. And also just to Julia's question, um, the Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program and Adirondack Watershed Institute have been meeting with DEC for the last, you know, probably two or three weeks since they've been figuring out how they're going to roll out the new certification program. And we're hoping to have you know, pass out as much of the DEC information as we can as soon as we get it. They really were just beginning to unroll it and unveil it earlier this week. So we've got a couple press releases out. We send it out on our listserv. But I think I just want to echo what Brian says. For all of you who are out there who love your lakes, um, I think just let all of your friends and family know, look, it's really important to clean, drain, dry your boat find out where the closest inspection station or decontamination station is, get your boat decontaminated, it's the right thing to do. And it'll help you comply with the law. But really, we want to focus on having people just get their boats decontaminated as often as they can. Um, I see there's a question in the chat about, is variable leaf milfoil the same as Eurasian? water milfoil. No, these are two different species, but that's, so that's good to bring up. Um, milfoils are the general term you'll hear people use, and they are the, the genus um, Myriophyllum. Um, interestingly, in New York, um, variable leaf milfoil is considered native in part of the state, but in other parts of the state is considered invasive. So depending on where you are in New York, uh, can determine the invasive or native status of that. Um, there also are um, many other native milfoils, so northern milfoil, um, Farwell's milfoil. Um, you know, so there's I think there's like six or eight species depending on where you are in New York of native milfoils. So um, so yeah, so uh, you do need to pay attention and variable leaf can be a little bit tricky to identify. Um, Eurasian is, is a little bit easier, has longer spacing and inner nodes and has a clipped uh, feather-like leaf where the top of it is clipped flat. So it's pretty easy to identify. Um, variable leaf is a little bit, uh, looks a little bit more similar to, to the, some of the native species. Um, so that's why if you do collect the sample and you're unsure, uh, take a good photo and collect a physical sample. And that way you can bring it to like a boat steward and ask them, or you can send it to like a local PRISM representative, like somebody like myself, and we can help uh, identify it. Um, where is variable leaf um, considered native? Um, it is considered native in New York in the, uh, generally in the Western part of the state. Um, and we are also working on some uh, 
some actual uh, genetic work with the DEC to try to uh, try to identify genotypes across the region to see where that where those lines are. Um, I will send out a link to a map. There's a good map through uh, the USGS of where they consider very relief native and where um, it, it is not. So, and they do that kind of by drainage. Well, there are no more questions. You know, we really uh, uh, appreciate everybody taking time out of the day. We hope you can attend an ISOL event later on. So if you're in the Saranac region tonight and you wanna come out to Hotel Saranac, um, I'll be there. Or you can come down to Lake Flower Boat Launch uh, from now to five and we'll be out there. But uh, if not, we hope you get out and you get to love your lake in whatever part of New York that you are in. And um, yeah, really thank you for your, your great stewardship and joining us here today. Thank you very much. All right, everybody have a happy ISOL. Thank you. Right. Just seeing if there's any questions for anyone still on the line. Otherwise, I'll be ending the meeting for all. <laughs>